is a reading from the ninth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, because they heard the voice, but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now, there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered him, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up. And go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many things about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus. The word of the Lord. So I did my unit of chaplaincy in seminary, serving as a police chaplain in the city of New Orleans. Right? So I took a leave of absence from my job, and I moved to New Orleans and uh, served as a police chaplain. And they kind of took us who were uh, being chaplains and paired us together in teams, and we kind of went around uh, serving in the, in the city that way uh, throughout my time there. And I was paired with a woman named Dara. Now, Dara was a Disciples of Christ seminarian, right? I think going to seminary in Louisville think, 
right? And we were paired up. And we would do things together, and um, we would chat as we were going from place to place, or as we were just kind of hanging out, telling our life stories, getting to know each other. And she would tell a story, and I would tell a story, and she'd tell a bigger story, and I'd tell an even bigger story. You know, that's what you do in New Orleans, right? Um, and she would always kind of end the story, or in the middle of the story, or say something, well, that was B.C., right? And this and that, and I did this and that, and, this, and that was B.C. And I, finally, I said, Dara, you, you're not that old. <laughs> what is this B.C.? And she said what? Before conversion. Close, close. You got the before. Before conversion. And I said, what do you mean by that, Dara? And she told me, you know, before I accepted Christ, before, before Christ came into my life, before, before I believed, I, when, when that happened, bam, I was changed. I had a conversion experience. And so I, she said, I, I talk about things B.C., before conversion. Right? And, and now I'm different now. And so I asked her to tell me her conversion story. And it was a powerful, powerful story. Um, and so then she asked me the question, well, what's your conversion story? And I said, uh, well, we're Lutheran. We don't get converted. <laughs> right? And she kind of looked, well, what do you mean by that? And I'm like, oh, okay, hold on, slow down, slow down. Right? I'm, you know, I said, well, you see, we, uh, we kind of lean a little more heavy into the grace. And we lean the more heavy into understanding that God is already in a relationship with us before even our existence. Right? So, so we don't really have these, this moment where I can tell you this was the minute. This was the day. This was the that. Um, and, and in some ways... I wish we did have kind of that moment. But and we went on, and she would always, um, she, would, she would jokingly, as we were telling even bigger and bigger stories as we were together, and she'd say, uh, oh, B.C., oh, you don't know what that's about. I'm like, all right, I get it. Right? But Dara came to mind. Now it's been, I don't know, 22, 23 years since I've seen Dara or talked to her, right, when we were together in New Orleans. But she came to mind today, uh, this week, as I was wrestling with, with the story in, in the book of Acts. Because we, we commonly call this story in the book of Acts the conversion of Paul, of Saul, right? Saul's Hebrew name is Saul. His Roman name is Paul. That's why we have these two names. Hebrew, Saul, Roman, Paul, right? So... We have this, what we typically call Paul's conversion today. And Dara came to mind, right? And so I wrestled as, as I heard her keep asking me. It's like, oh man, conversion's in the Bible. Maybe we should think a little more about that. Right, those of us, and, and maybe wrestle with this conversion notion a little bit. So I did, right? And I was really struck. I was struck more by the conversion of Ananias than, than I was the conversion of Paul. Right? Let's look at Ananias. I, was, I kind of was drawn to Ananias, right? Now, Paul, Saul, <clears throat> right, if we go back just a little bit, two chapters, this is chapter 7 of Acts, right? At the very end, chapter 7 is the stoning of Stephen, first martyr of the church. Right? And at the very end of chapter 7, it says, As they prepared to stone Stephen, they took off their coats, the, those who were going to stone him, and they put them at the feet of a young man named Saul. It's chapter 7. Then we move to chapter 8. And this young man named Saul went through Jerusalem binding those who believed in the way. That was what they called Christianity back then and sent them in prison, men, women, and children. Right? That's chapter 8. Let me get to chapter 9, which I read for you. Then he goes <clears throat> to the chief priest and asks for a letter, you know, authority to do this same thing. So this is who Saul is. Right? Now, Ananias is just sitting at home. 
hanging out. And all of a sudden, ding, right? Ananias. Right? And he must have had conversations with the Lord because he knew who it was. And he said, here I am, Lord. He says, Ananias, you're going to go into the city and you're going to see this guy named Saul and you're going to lay hands on him and you're going to tell him he's going to do great things for the kingdom. And Ananias goes, uh, hmm, God, uh, I know this guy named Saul. And I know the evil he's done. And I think you're asking me to go, how about I go see James, right? This, this Saul, he, he puts people in prison. And, and I'm sure Ananias is thinking, and if I go, I may end up in prison. Or worse. Uh, I, God, can you rethink who you want me to go see? And God says what? Ananias. Go and do what I told you to do. Because this man's going to be an instrument of great things for the kingdom of God. So then here's Ananias. He does what? He goes. <whistles> right? Saul, <laughs> right? And, and he walks up, and he lays his hands on Saul. And you can almost imagine him bending over and whispering cheek to cheek in Saul's ear, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who you persecuted has sent me so that you can see. Right? He, he touches him his enemy, and he whispers, brother, a, a familiar name, saying, we're family, me and you, together. That's a conversion experience, right? Ananias was just here, he knows Saul, but then what? He's changed in a moment. He's converted to believe something entirely different against everything he knows to be true. That's powerful. Right? Ananias can go, yeah, B.C., I didn't like Saul. Right? He was talking to Dara. Right? But then we get to Saul, right? The story. Kind of the main character. Right? Now, actually, this story of Saul's conversion, Paul's conversion, appears five times in the New Testament. It appears here in chapter 9 where it actually happens in the story. Then, later on in the book of Acts, Paul tells the story twice while he's on his missionary trips. And then he also tells the story in the letter to the church of Corinth and in the letter to the church of Galatia. So we get this story five times about Paul's conversion. Right? Now Paul saw was doing what he thought God was calling him to do. He thought he was being faithful in persecuting followers of Jesus. He thought God was calling him to do this very thing. And then goes and asks the authority of the religious leaders to do it. So Paul thinks he's being faithful to God. And then, bam, on the road to Damascus. It's knocked to the ground. Can't see. Jesus appears to him, says, why are you persecuting me? And then this guy, Ananias, shows up and he lays hands on him and he calls me brother and then I can see. And he immediately is baptized and then spends three days with the disciples in Damascus and then goes out and and becomes one of the uh, greatest uh, apostles to the Gentile world, right? Paul, Saul, is converted, totally changed in this moment, right? This moment of conversion, right? This is what Dara was talking about when she asked me the question, when did this happen to you? Well, 
The truth is, as Lutherans, we do talk about conversion. We just don't necessarily use that word. Luther talks about it a lot. In fact, Luther has a similar experience to Saul, right? In the story, if you remember back to catechism, I won't test you, right? right? You're welcome, <laughs> right? right? Luther's riding on a horse, and there's a storm, like this morning, right? I was praying this, storm, this morning, please let me get to Marion, right? Before, please let me get to Marion. Well, you know, Luther's riding in a storm, lightning, thunder, rain, and he goes, and he prays to St. Anne. Anne is the patron saint of his family. St. Anne, if, if you save me, if you allow me to get home, I'll, I'll dedicate my life to God. Be careful what you pray for. You may just get it. And then, but he, but he talks about this moment of conversion in the storm where his life is changed. He, he realizes by his surviving the storm and the reason why he was able to survive the storm um, is an attribution to the power of God. And so it changes his life. And he goes on to speak about this conversion experience. And so much so that, that Luther said, that we are constantly going through a conversion. Constantly. That it's not a one-and-done type of thing. It's not just the moment the water hits our heads. But it's every moment can be a conversion experience for us. That every moment, everything we say and do, every encounter we have, has the potential to completely change us. That every person we run into, every storm we travel through, every word that is spoken or smile that is given can give us an entirely different understanding of who we are and what we're called to do. Luther goes on to say that we should realize this continual conversion experience every day so that the last thing you do you pick up your feet put them in bed you say the lord's prayer you cross yourself and then you give yourself to god to change you so that when you wake up in the morning you are a new person that the slate is clean and you can be open to new things. And he says, the first thing you do in the morning is you cross yourself, you say the Lord's Prayer, and give thanks for being changed in the night. That's Luther's understanding of conversion. That's what I explained to Dora all those many years ago. That we, we are people of conversion. And maybe we should, as, as Christians of the Lutheran tradition, should recover this language of conversion once again. So much so that this week, as I was wrestling with this text, um, I haven't speak, spoken to Dara, I haven't seen her spoken to her since we left New Orleans in 20-some uh, years. And I look for her on Facebook, because you can find anybody on Facebook, right? Dara, go, right? And I did. And I found her. And I sent her a message. And I said, you may not remember me, but we were together, and you asked me a question years and years ago about conversion, and your, your, your conversation has changed me, so much so that I'm going to talk about you in my sermon on Sunday morning. And I hope you don't mind, <laughs> because it's half written, right? And I heard back from her, and she said, of course I remember you. And she said, in fact, our conversations about conversion changed me. Because as you explained, your understanding of conversion gave me a new understanding of things, and it has stuck with me all of these years. Right? So as we go out into the world today, hopefully there's a little bit of mist, a little sprinkle that hits our heads that reminds us of the waters of baptism. Right? That as, as baptized believers, we we understand we are constantly being molded and changed and converted to, 
to let the scales of the past shed so that our eyes can be open to the future. That we can, we can rest our heads every night giving thanks that God is so powerful, God can change our lives, even despite our best efforts against it. <laughs> right? So go out and, and today just enjoy the potentials uh, that God has in store for us now and until that time when God makes everything new once and for all. Amen. Let us the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 21st chapter. After he appeared to his followers in Jerusalem, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach. But the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far off from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore... They saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, Son of John, 
Do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, Follow me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. So I did my chaplaincy training for seminary, serving as a police chaplain in the city of New Orleans. So I took some time off, a significant amount of time off my uh, day job, right? and I moved to New Orleans and uh, served as a police chaplain there. Um, and they kind of paired us up into teams with other people who were there doing their chaplaincy work as a police chaplain in New Orleans. And I was paired up uh, with a woman named Dara. Now, Dara was a Disciples of Christ seminary student preparing to go uh, into ministry as a pastor in the Disciples of Christ tradition. And we would talk and, uh, you know, hang out. And we, you know, between times of driving places or just walking, um, we would tell stories. So I would tell a story and uh, she would tell a bigger story. Right, and, and, and then I would tell a bigger story, and she'd tell a bigger story, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's what preachers do. <laughs> um, but she would tell a story, and every once in a while, she would tell a story of something she did, and she, she would turn to me and say, oh, that was B.C. And then she would do something else, and another story, oh, that was B.C. And after a while, I, I said, Dara, um, you're not that old. What does B.C. mean? She said, before conversion. And I said, what do you mean by that? And she goes, well, you know, conversion. <laughs> conversion. And then she explained, um, it was before the time that, that Christ had entered her life. And how she had accepted Jesus and, and how her life had changed in that moment. A conversion. And so I asked her to tell me her conversion story powerful story, a wonderful story. Uh, remember it to this day. And then, of course, she turned to me and said, well, what's your conversion story? And I said, uh, we're Lutheran. We don't believe in conversion. <laughs> and she looked at me and said, well, what are you talking about? I said, well, I said, hang on, hang on, hang on, right? Uh, that's, I said, we, we, we have a different understanding of conversion, right? We don't... Uh, we, we see it as this kind of, uh, we kind of lean a little more into that whole grace thing. And we see that our relationship with God existed even before we existed. And, and, uh, and I tried to explain to her kind of our understanding and why we tend not to use conversion language uh, here in the Lutheran Church. Um, and she said, nah, that's interesting. And then whenever she would tell stories, bigger and bigger and better as we got, got going, you know, she would say, oh, that was B.C. Oh, you don't know what that is. And then she would, we would chuckle, right? Well, it's been 20-some years since Dara and I were together. And that, and that kind of conversation we had all those years ago stuck with me. And it came back to memory this week as I wrestled with the story from Acts this morning. Because typically, the ninth chapter of Acts that we heard this morning, we, we call the conversion of Paul, right? It's Paul's story. And uh, just to, so Saul is his Hebrew name, Paul is his Roman name. That's why we get different names for him. So in the story, it's, 
kind of the Hebrew telling, so it uses Saul for it. So it's this conversion of, of, of Saul, of Paul, and how he has changed his B.C. story, right? Well, if we look at his B.C. story, and we flip back some of the pages, and you get back into chapter 7 of the book of Acts, that's the stoning of Stephen, the deacon, first martyr of the church. As we come to the end of chapter 7, it says, uh, those who were to stone Stephen took off their cloaks and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. And that's how chapter 7 kind of comes to an end. Then you flip the page, chapter 8, and it talks about the young man Saul who went through Jerusalem imprisoning those of the way. It's what we called Christianity back then. Right? So anybody who was a believer of Jesus, he would seize them, men and women and children, and put them in prison. Um, that was Saul, Paul. And then we flip the page to chapter 9. Well, Dara came to mind in conversion stories, and, and maybe my conversion story, what, what might that be? That question Dara asked me all those years ago. And I started looking into, into Acts 9 for maybe a hint. And I came upon Ananias. Now, who is Ananias in this story? Now, Ananias is the guy... He's hanging out at home, right? And all of a sudden, um, he hears a voice. Ding! Ananias! And he must have talked to God before, because he knew who it was. Uh, here I am, Lord! Right? And the Lord says, Ananias, you're going to go to this house in the city, and you're going to find this man, Saul of Tarsus, and you're going to um, you're going to you're going to lay hands on him, and you're going to tell him everything's going to be okay, and how he's going to be an instrument to do great things for the kingdom. And Ananias goes, uh, Ananias, uh, I, I, I think you have the wrong guy, God. Because uh, I know this guy, Saul of Tarsus, and he's not a good guy. And he do you know what he's doing down here? Uh, it, I'm sure Ananias realized that if he went to Saul, he might well get put in prison himself. Maybe his family. Risked it all. And God says what? Ananias, go. Do what I told you to do. Right? And then, Ananias goes. And he walks into the house, right? And he lays hands upon Saul, his enemy, or at least who he thought he was his enemy an hour or so ago. And then you can almost imagine him leaning down cheek to cheek and whispering in his ear, Brother Saul, the Lord has sent me so that you can see again and do great things. That is a conversion story. Here's Ananias, who knew who Saul was, and despite it all, despite every truth he knew to be true, leaned in and laid hands upon him and touched him cheek to cheek and called him brother family. We're the same. Powerful conversion story. Right? And, then, and then we get Saul, Paul's story. Right Now actually, this is the first of five times it appears in the New Testament. It appears here in the telling of the story as it happened. Right? Chapter 9. And then Paul goes off on his missionary trips in, in the book of Acts he tells the story two more times, and then he tells it in his letter to the church of Corinth, and he tells it in his letter to the church of Galatia. So we get it five times. Powerful story. Here's someone who was a persecutor of the church, imprisoned those of the way, 
and firmly believed he was doing what God wanted him to do. Saul thought he was being faithful in doing these acts. In fact, he goes to the religious leaders and asks for a letter to give him the authority to do this. And then in an instant, bam! Bright flash of light, falls to the ground, can't see, goes to a strange house, someone he's never met, comes to him, lays hands on him, calls him brother, and all of a sudden the scales fall from his eyes and he can see. And he immediately is baptized, spends three days with the disciples, and then goes out and becomes one of the greatest apostles for the Gentile world. That's a conversion experience, right? Powerful story, so much so we get it five times. And it, and it drew me back to Dara's question of me. What's my conversion story? And I think I have one. I think we all have one, actually. Luther does, right? If we go back... In the catechism, right? I'm going to test you today. But the story of Luther, he's riding through a storm, much like this morning, right? I was praying this morning, please let me get to Marion, please let me get to Marion, right? Lightning, thunder, rain. He's riding a horse. And he says a prayer to St. Anne. Anne is the patron saint of his family. He says, St. Anne, if you, you allow me to get home safely, I will dedicate my life to the Lord. An example of being... Be careful for what we pray for, because <laughs> we may just get it. And he gets home safely. And he does dedicate his life to the Lord. He sees this moment in the storm as a conversion moment, something that changes him, changes his mind, changes his attitude, changes his very being. And, and he goes on to write about these experiences in each of our lives are to have these moments. And it's not meant to be a once-for-all moment. You know, it's, it's not just the moment the water hits our head. That's a conversion moment, no doubt. But we have others throughout our life, other moments where God takes something and allows that something to change us, to change our mind, change change who we are, change our being, change our understanding, a moment of conversion. Right? And Luther says these happen to us all the time, so much so that we should pray for it every day. Right? We, Luther writes, we are called to go to bed each night. And the last thing we should do, we lift our feet and place them on the bed. We say the Lord's Prayer and cross ourselves and offer ourselves up to God to be changed. And then when you awake in the next moment, the first thing you should do is cross yourself, say the Lord's Prayer, and give thanks that you are a new creation today that you weren't yesterday. That we take each day as this opportunity for conversion. This opportunity to be something else that God is calling us to be. Right? That, that God will present these opportunities time and time again. Until that moment when God, as uh, I even brought my bulletin, says, this is the the year of vision, it says, see, I am making all things new. This is the verse we've been working with this year. Until that moment when God converts all of creation into what it was intended to be. And we will all be made new forever. 